Please stand for the floor when we break. Is that, are you guys doing that? Okay, sorry.
to us. That we shall be called the sons of God. That we shall be called the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we shall be called the sons of God. That we shall be called the sons of God. Now, please stand as you're able as we sing the choral intro in the garden. <clears throat> sunny day, a little chilly, but after, uh, what is it, 82 yesterday in the middle of the day, I'll welcome the chilliness this morning. Um, but it is a beautiful day, and there's, I do not believe it's going to rain today, so if you have an opportunity to get out and walk and or do some gardening, you know, my wife always says that it's best to do gardening after the rain um, because the ground is softened up a little bit. So if you want to do gardening today or whatever, uh, where you can be outside in God's creation, touching feeling, smelling, seeing everything that God has given us. I, I encourage you to do that, and it's a beautiful day to do that. I want to welcome you all here to Colemanville United Methodist Church, and I'm going to turn to the bulletin for some announcements. Um, first is that to this afternoon after the service, uh, we will be having a movie, well, a light lunch from 1130 to 1230, followed by a movie, The Resurrection of Gavin Stone. So I just want to encourage anyone who if you have the time and, and availability, please join us for both the lunch time for cello, uh, fellowship and and um, and just being together, and then an opportunity to watch a movie again together. We're going to do that right here in the sanctuary. Um, so I encourage everyone to do that. As a result of the movie, um, I am going to cancel the weekly prayer meeting. Um, that way, you know we don't have to be here all day. But um, for those who do pray it for, whether you pray with us or pray at home, I want to encourage you to do so um, when you get home. Um, at four o'clock. That being said, I also, uh, we're going to do some experimenting with the prayer meeting. Um, the same group of people have come together uh, for the past, well, I don't remember how long when we started it, but um, we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to shift something. We're going to, instead of doing it at four o'clock on Sundays for the next several weeks, we're actually going to do it right after uh, Sunday school on Sunday. So for those who may not want to go home and come back, if you can, um, you know, you're welcome to stay from basically 11.30 to about 12.30. Usually, we usually run about an hour. So starting um, next week, the 30th, the, uh, the, the March, or sorry, March, May 7th and May 14th, that those will be the times of the prayer meeting. And then we'll see how it goes. It may continue. We may change it to a different time. But we want to just offer the opportunity for anyone who wants to come and pray with us to come and pray with us. There's nothing better than corporate prayer. It's a bit challenging at times when you to pray out loud amongst your brothers and sisters in Christ, but we want to encourage you to do so. So we want to give you that opportunity. So we're going to shift, experiment with the time a little bit for the next uh, three weeks starting next week. Speaking of prayer, May 4th, there is a sign-up sheet for the National Day of Prayer. Since I have been here, we've held a 24-hour vigil of prayer, and we ask everyone to sign up for a 15 minute slot. Sign up for more than one if you like. But for 15 minutes on that day, on May 4th, from midnight to 11.59 p.m., we're asking that you just take 15 minutes to just 
push everything else aside, whatever you can do, whether if it's possible at work or at home or whatever, just, just push everything else aside and take those 15 minutes and just <laughs> connect with God and, and just pray and ask God's uh, blessing and mercy and grace on our church, on each other, on our families, on our nation, on, on whatever's in your heart, right? Take those 15 minutes. Now, 15 minutes, when you're thinking, when you talk about prayer, I get it. 15 minutes sounds like a lot. But think about what you do in an entire day. Think about how much you accomplish in a 24-hour period of time. And what we're asking you is to take 196th of that day, 196th of an entire day, and just pray. So if you need resources or if you have questions, please reach out to me. I, um, we can come up with a, maybe a small little, um, like a little sheet next week that talks about what you can pray for and how you can pray and things like that. So that, that, so that would be helpful. Um, but there's a shot, sign up sheet in the back. And if you need, if you have any questions, you can contact Jill Kelly or Judy Stoner. Um, that being said, there's quite a bit of other things in the, in the bulletin. I just want to point out that we do have uh, two fundraisers coming up in May, but I want to, I want you to focus particularly on the chicken barbecue, not so much the fundraiser itself, but what it's going to support. We are called to be good stewards of everything that God has given us. God has blessed us with this church. And the wall outside the church, we drive by it, we walk past it, we don't think about it. But that wall has sustained its job, has done its job for a long, long time. I don't even know, probably way older than I, before I was even born, I'm sure that wall was built. And what we need to do is take good care of it because it's taken good care of our property and, and it's done its job. So that uh, the, the proceeds of the chicken barbecue are going to support um, basically maintaining the walls, right? The retaining, that retaining wall, which is, um, you know, just re, um, repointing it, which means taking all the, all the, the, um, oh my gosh, the cement. That's a good thing of the word. The cement that holds all the stones together, taking it all out and repointing and, re and cleaning it all up. One, so it looks good, but two, that it may last another 50, 60, 70, 100 years, right? It just, we need to take good care of the things that God has blessed us with. So that, uh, the proceeds of the chicken barbecue will go to support that. I just want to point that out. Um, yes. Thank you. The VBS meeting, which is tomorrow night, will be at uh, what time is 630? 6.30 will be held in the education building. So if anyone is planning to come, uh, if you come over to the to the to this building and don't see anyone, that's because we're all sitting out there. So please join us at 6.30 tomorrow afternoon if you're interested in VBS. Even if you're not necessarily willing to commit, but curious to, do what, to hear what we do, come on out. Come on out and just listen. And maybe God's putting in your heart to, to participate. Maybe it's because you want to see what we're doing so you can bring your children or grandchildren, right? So if you're really interested in VBS in any way, you don't have to volunteer. We'd like you to volunteer. We hope you volunteer. But even if you just have questions about what we're doing, please come and join us. So that way, if you, as you pass the word around, if people have questions for you, you have the answers, right? So please join us tomorrow after, or tomorrow evening at 6.30 in the, edu in the education building. Um, also, I want to let you know, it's not in the bulletin anywhere, but we've been hearing that there's questions about the transition, right? It's been a really long time since this church has been, had a part, had a pastor serving more than one congregation. And so there's, there may be, most of us may not remember what that's like or have, or not really understand how that's going to be accomplished. We don't necessarily have all the answers, but we want to give you the opportunity to ask questions. So we hear your, your concerns, hear your questions and maybe if we do have an answer for you, we can provide some comfort that things are, you know, that things are being well thought of and planned out. So instead of uh, social time next week, we're actually going to take that time, that half hour between um, the service and Sunday school to just sit in the sanctuary. And we're going to allow anyone who has a question to ask questions. And Sarah is chair of SPRC and I will be up here and we will be writing all those questions down. Somebody will be writing all those questions down. Um, but we want to give you that chance to ask, right? We want to make sure that we're completely transparent and hear your concerns. Because if it is a significant concern, we can take that back and, and really you know, think about it and come up with a, a solution to what that concern might be. So 
next week, the 30th, instead of a social hour, we will be taking time right here in the sanctuary to answer any questions that we can answer or to make sure we, we take note of them, um, you know, in response to, to anybody's concerns about what, what ministry will look like here in Colmanville after July 1st. If, you, if there's someone who's not here today that you know has questions, and please go make sure you invite them to next week. Let them know that you heard that, you know, we're going to take that time next week. They don't even have to come every Sunday. Maybe it's somebody who watches us online or somebody who you, uh, you know, you connect with on the phone on a regular basis that they are members here or, or, people, or someone who just hasn't been able to come in a long time. Make sure you let them know that we're going to have that conversation next week. Anything else? No? With that, let us bow our heads and begin our worship with prayer. Dear Lord, in this Easter season, we celebrate the triumph of life over death. This is the good news of Jesus, our risen Savior. In his resurrection, we are born anew with him. Born of the immortal, of the everlasting, born into a living hope. Fill us all with good gifts of your Holy Spirit that we may share your love with others in boldness and power. We give thanks, O oh Lord, for all that Jesus has done for us. And we pray this morning in his name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we sing the first hymn, They Will Know We Are Christians. Oh. 
Next, we'll be singing the hymn, Bind Us Together.
Amen. This morning as we approach the altar in prayer, um, one, I, I don't know my usual custom to talk about celebrities, but um, I don't know if anyone knows Andy Stanley, or Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley passed away earlier this week. Um, and I only mention it because he was a huge part of my spiritual formation growing up. I mean, I used to listen to him on the radio and I hear from various people as I visit them that, you know, he was a big part of their connection to ministry and, and hearing the gospel and preaching. So he's had a long ministry on television. So just I want to let you know that that, that Charles Stanley passed away. And for those of you who remember his, his radio ministry and television ministry, um, I'm sure it was a big part of, of your growth and, and everything that was going on. So I um, just want to lift up uh, his full entire family in prayer. Um, I also listened to his son, Andy Stanley. So that's why I mentioned his name first. Um, there's a lot going on in our communities. Paying attention to what's going on in, in the news and social media. But just as people are getting out and about, there just seems to be a lot more accidents on the road and a lot more things happening. So we just want to I just want to lift up our entire community um, and and just, you know, as things shift, as the weather changes, um, you know, just continue to lift up our community as we approach a season of spending time outside, which you hear about a lot from me because I love to be outside, but also um, just there's going to be a lot of things happening in our in in Conestoga and, and surrounding areas, and so I just want to continue to lift up that entire community. And as uh, as I mentioned earlier today, we are, um, you know, we're we're shifting. We're we're going from a pastor. You've had a pastor. The Colemanville has had a pastor solely focused on Colemanville for well over thirty years now. Actually, closer to forty. Right, almost forty. Um, and so it's different, right? It's going to be different going forward. So I just want to lift up Pastor Manny as he, um, transitions into our community and start supporting Colemanville, but also supporting Beams Church. So we want to lift up Beams Church as well, um, at annual, at, at ad board. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the needs that Beams Church has, you know, there, Pastor Manny would be living in the parsonage over there. So as a body of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, if we want to support Beams Church, I know they're looking for manpower. They're looking for help in um, preparing the parsonage for, for Pastor Manny. There's uh, Reverend Joan Trout is living in the parsonage right now. So that means that there's like a two to window. Once she moves out, then we can get everything ready for Pastor Manny to move in. So if you have the time and the skills, something that, you know, maybe you have, you're very handy and want to help out. You love to paint. I hate painting. But some people just love to paint walls. And some people love to tear out carpet and, and clean things up. And, you know, if you have that, that passion in your life that you love to do that work, um, I'm sure that you can, um, we, there, there'll be plenty of work for you in, in preparing uh, the Beans Church Parsonage for Pastor Manny. So if you do, are interested, please see Sarah. Um, and she will direct you to who's going to be responsible for for that coordinating that. But um, but you know, Beams Church isn't that far away, and there are brothers and sisters not only in Christ but another United Methodist Church. So we are very connectional, and so if you, anything we can do to start building a closer relationship with Beams Church, I think would be well appreciated. And finally, um, I just want to lift up. I hate I you know. Heart, forgive me, but I, I really don't like this to be about me. But um, just so you know, things that are going on in my life, um, because I need prayer too, um, is that I am, my last day with the college is uh, this coming Friday. Um, so there will be uh, several weeks of uncertainty in my life, as uh, in my life for Jezreel and I, as our finances shift in response to the changes that are going on. So just be with us or just pray with us in that, right? Pray that things go smoothly, that no unexpected financial things pop up on our radar and that um, I'm a little nervous, to be honest. And, and so um, I just ask for your prayer and, and consideration in all of that. With that, um, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, O Lord, because as your children, you invite us to bring our prayers to you. Scripture tells us that your love for us was such that you gave the gift of Jesus Christ to us so that one day we may be in your presence. But you've also promised that we don't have to wait until that day, that we as a body can care for one another, can take care of one another, and just just in the day-to-day just be, be, be there for each other and support one another in all the things that happen in our lives. So as this ministry changes, as things move forward according to your plan, O oh Lord, help us to be open to what you ask of us. Help us to, be, to take bold steps to declare the glory of you in our lives, O oh Lord. That, we, that others can see that what makes us different isn't that we're special, isn't that we have been given any kind of special status or that, that we have um, anything that isn't available to anyone else, but that is by our faith and our trust in you and in what Jesus has done for us, that we can live lives of joy, of love, lives where all our concerns and our cares are just given over to you so that we have the strength and peace to be here in this place, no matter what goes on. So Lord, as the next few weeks, things start to shape and and, uh, all the transitions that need to happen start happening, oh Lord, we ask that you just give us that peace, that your wisdom and that the Holy Spirit just walk with us through this journey that we are just prepared for whatever comes your way, whatever comes our way, that you have given us. Not because, again, because we are, we are special, and, and, but that you equip us for all these things. That we just put our trust in you such that we can speak boldly about all that you have done. We give you thanks and praise in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And as children of a living God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Dave Topper forward to read the scriptural reading for today, which is found in the first book of Peter, chapter 1, verses 17 to 22. If you're using a pew Bible, it's um, found on uh, page 212. Our scripture for today is praise to God for our living hope. Since you are called on, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishing, perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but for the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for each other, Love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. This ends the reading of God's word. Amen. May the reading of God's word be a blessing upon you all. 
So uh, we are in the epistle of 1 Peter. We talked quite a bit last week about the context of, of this letter to uh, Christian communities in Asia Minor. And it's, it's significant that of where the, these, um, these Christian communities were growing because, excuse me, they were, um, it, was, it was two things. One, it was Christians who had started in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas and they're spread out, right? They start moving and, and they start moving into other areas and they're moving away from Israel, right? Into new places. And they're, they're in Asia Minor. Now, Asia Minor is mostly a Greek and Roman area, right? Turkey and, and a lot of um, other places that where there was a lot of what we consider now, you know, European influence. But this was influence of, of these, of these um, cultures that had like these multiple gods, right? They had pantheons of gods, gods for everything. And now comes with these Christians who are moving out of Israel, this story of a risen Savior, the story of God incarnate. And this is a God, this isn't just any God. This isn't the God of the sea, the God of the sky, the God of, the, of, of nature. This is the one true God, the eternal God, the creator God, the one God that made and fashioned the entire world. The universe. Now, people can wrap their heads around that, right? About a God who is transcendent and can do all these things. But when they hear this story, this gospel, this when gospel literally means good news, right? So they hear the good news of that God loved the, loved all of us so much that He came down to be with us in the flesh. Now, I'm sure they could wrap their heads around that because they heard stories of other gods who took on the, the to, who look like humans to interact with people. And what really probably threw them was this idea that in his flesh, he went to the cross. He died for us. And they all understood the meaning of the cross and what kind of death that was. And then was risen again, right? Because I'm sure when they heard that he went to the cross, they're like, oh, then he's probably not God. He was just a prophet, uh, just a teacher. Then they heard the resurrection story. And it probably piqued a lot of interest. It probably had people wondering, who is this Jesus? Was he really God? Did he really come for all of us? But the gospel started spreading everywhere. Now, some people believed in, some didn't. But now imagine a, a new faith comes into your community and your children start to listen and believe. And it's not the faith you grew up with. It's a little disconcerting. So these church communities started growing in these, in these towns where they were, it, was a, it was the gospel brought in by people that are not from that area. And it started to influence other people. And these communities were growing. And they were growing in such a way that made all the people who lived in that area very, very uncomfortable. Sometimes hostile. And so the writer of 1 Peter is trying to give words of encouragement. Words that will bind them all together. To help them sur survive in the midst of hostile, uh, living in a hostile uh, area where where no one really wants this new faith, where this new faith is changing people in ways that makes all the, the local people very, very uncomfortable. And so last week we talked a little bit about um, the author basically telling people, telling these new Christians to hold on to your faith, that, that it's going to help you um, survive trials and, and difficulties. But today he goes one step further says, it's not just about you. It's not just about how that faith impacts you. But in that faith, we are called to love one another, to care for each other, and to support one another. That is the faith that we know. That is the faith 
that built this community and has sustained this community for 173 years, 74 years. Again, we don't think about, we think about things in the context of our lives. But this community has been here for 174 years. We have to ask ourselves why. We have to ask ourselves how. How has this church been able to stay together that long? How has the Christian faith been able to spread around the world for the last 2,000 years, even into hostile communities? That's what we're going to explore today. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, O Lord, we give you thanks for all that you have done and continue to do for us, O Lord. Often when we, can, we can't even think about what tomorrow is going to look like, you, you bless us and promise us a life of joy, a life held together by our faith. So as we explore that this morning, we ask you to just let the Holy Spirit fill this space. Help us to calm ourselves, to put all our concerns aside and take time to listen, to hear, to know that you are God and that you are with us and that you will take care of us. And as we share our stories this morning, that you will continue to, to bless us in the ways that, that we see evident in the lives of brothers and sisters that we have come to know and love. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As I mentioned last week, we looked deeply, we looked a little closer at what the author was, the author of 1 Peter was talking about. And when he was saying, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. These words brought comfort to a people who were hearing the gospel but never had an encounter with Jesus Christ. That helps us who 2,000 years later have never seen Christ in the flesh. We never sat at his feet and heard his voice. But yet we have come to believe in him. We've come to believe in him because we have learned, right? What does it mean to be a Christian? Most of us have grown up in Christian communities, Christian families, and have seen what the power of the gospel can do for others. And I pray that each and every one of you has had a personal encounter with Christ. Now, that's silly. It sounds silly, right? It isn't silly. It sounds silly. Because I just said, we've never met him. We've never heard him. We've never seen or touched him. But as followers, as Christians, we believe that there is more than the material, more than the seen, more than what we can touch. There is an overwhelming and overpowering spiritual aspect of our lives. And that Christ speaks to us in our spirits, connects with us, guides us, leads us, and leads us to a better life when we become followers of Jesus Christ. That, if you, if you really, I don't know if you ever read, heard, like said those words to yourself in the way that you understand it, the way you experience it. As a pastor, I've studied these words and I've looked through these things and, and I, can, I can speak from the Bible, but I personally like to speak from my own experience. And so, when I say these words about how God has, you know, in Christ, loves us, supports us, guides us, and leads us, please know, please hear that I'm speaking from personal experience. That this isn't just my education, it's not my study of scripture. But I hope you hear the sincerity of my words. Because that is what, the, that is what, Pete, the author of 1 Peter is talking about when he says, 
you love him, though you, not ha- you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you, have not, you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. It's inexpressible because what we're, well, how can you explain to someone a love for a person you've never met? How can you talk to someone about, about how that person changed your life and yet say, well, I've never actually sat with them. I never actually talked with them. So the question is, how do we do that? Well, you've heard me say, and I've heard others of you say it, is that we may be the only version of Christ anyone ever meets. We may be the only version of the gospel that anyone ever meets. Now, I'm not suggesting that we are the all-powerful Messiah creator. But when you have that relationship with Jesus Christ, Christ starts changing you. And it becomes visible. It becomes noticeable. People see that. People see the difference. The thing, I, the thing I do not like to do, the thing that drives me nuts that often I have to do is when someone who knew me when I was 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old comes up to me and says, you're a pastor? And I have seen that. You all laugh because you remember what it was like to be 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. You think you knew, you knew everything, right? You knew everything. No one could tell you what to do. No one could tell you how to live. You knew everything. And then, then it happens, right? The world doesn't spin according to your, how you wake up in the morning. The world doesn't, doesn't conform to what you think it should be. And then your life just starts to spiral out of control. Because then you realize it's not about you. It's not about you. That we have to live in a community with others. That we have to live among other people and share in values and share in, 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 in concern for one another. That the only way to really survive is to be part of a group. So then you have a group to choose. If you're sitting here today, it's you, what you're telling me is the, cho- the group that you chose was your community of faith, was the body of Christ. So fine, you chose that group. So now what? Well, if you're still here today, I know many of you have been in this church for years. I'm not trying to age you, but you've been here a long time. And I assume it's because this group cared for you and you cared for them. That when you decided to become a Christian, that when you actively chose to be here, you let Christ in and let Christ shape you so that you can care for those who were caring for you. So now imagine you're in a community of faith, brand new, never heard the gospel before, but something brought you here. Maybe it was curiosity, whatever it was, but something brought you to this community of faith, to the body of Christ, whether in Colemanville or anywhere else. And these people love you. And you know who you are. You know all the things you've done, all the unlovable things that you have done. And these people still love you. That doesn't come from us. That comes from Jesus Christ. That comes from the transformation of our lives that comes with being a faithful follower of Jesus. Doesn't happen day one. Could take time. For some, it takes months to a year. Others, it takes years. Granted, in our families and in our church families, there are people who are just unlovable. But we love them because Christ loved us when we were unlovable. Think about that for a minute. We don't know who walks through that door, what, they, what they're bringing with them, all the pain and trauma and, and challenges of their lives. And what Christ is asking us to do is just love them. 
nothing else, just love them so that he can work on them. Not us, so he can work on them. We are to create an environment of love such that anyone who walks through that door can at least feel comfortable enough to sit and breathe and let God start working on them and, and changing their, their perspective and changing their life and changing what's their, their pain into joy. But how will they do that, right? How will they know? Well, I would love to believe as a pastor that my words are, are part of their growth, but I'm going to be honest with you. 20 minutes on a Sunday morning is not enough. 20 minutes on a Sunday morning doesn't change our neural pathways, doesn't change how we feel about things. I need you to share the gospel. I need you to participate in that process. That when somebody comes through that door and they need love, all you have to do is walk up to them and say, hello, my name is welcome to this church. I'd like to say welcome home because this is a safe place, a place where you can just rest, a place where you will be loved no matter what, a place where no matter what you have done, no matter, you know, even if you come through the door smelling like alcohol, you know different. We will, we will love you and we will take care of you. And if you need help, we will be there with you. I know for a fact that Comanville is known for its hospitality, known for it, known for welcoming people in who've never, never stepped foot in here before. I've heard it time and again. I've seen it in action. We have been blessed with that gift from God, a gift of hospitality. It is a spiritual gift. It is a spiritual gift. We believe that the Holy Spirit imbues churches with gifts. And so we believe that God has gifted us with hospitality so people can come in and just rest. And so in the reading for today, the author says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. So by obeying the truth, the gospel, We are called to love one another. He says, so that you have sincere love for each other. I titled the sermon Mutual Love. That's another way of saying the same thing. Mutual love, love for one another. Because this love for, of Christ is bigger than us. It's bigger than our problem. It's bigger than our world. It is meant to be shared, not hoarded. So when we finally come to terms with that Christ loves us, now it's our chance to go share, uh, share that love with others, to talk about how Christ has shown his love in our lives, to talk about how that love changes who we are and can change someone in need. Because people are watching. They are watching. We don't think about it. We don't, we don't talk about it. But people in our communities, they know us. They come to the church for, for events, but they watch us. They watch us. You know, they're probably watching online right now saying, the pastor says this is a hospitable church. And they're going to come down and see just how, how hospitable we are. I welcome the challenge. Come on down. Because I guarantee you will find a church that thinks about you, cares about you, and is willing to go the extra step for you. That is what Christ calls for each and every one of us. And the best way to share that love, to help people understand what it is, is not by reading scripture to them. They're not ready for that yet. New Christians are not ready for scripture. I'm not saying scripture's bad. You've heard me say that. This is the foundation of our faith. At some point, they, you know, we need to, whether we start a new Christian uh, Bible study or get people into a prayer meet, whatever it is, but when somebody is new to the faith, or if someone maybe grew up in a, in, a, in a Christian household, but just like me, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, I walked away from my faith. I walked away from the church. God had to put special people in my life to bring me back. I'm just going to say that right now. 
But it wasn't the Bible that brought me back. It was when people shared their lives with me. When people were willing to talk about how they struggled. And I can be like, I struggled just like that too. And you're telling me Christ still loves me? Yes. Yes. So we are called to bear witness to that love. And so for the next few minutes, I want to take this opportunity to open up the floor for anyone who, this. remember I said this was going to be Testimony Sunday. I probably should have made a bigger deal about it. I apologize. But this is going to be an opportunity for anyone who wants to stand up. I'm going to invite you to come forward, right? Because I know it's scary to talk into a camera, but there are people online who need to hear this. And so we have a microphone up here, and I want you to come up and speak to the microphone so people who need to hear your testimony can hear it. Now, I know, I know a lot of you are shy. I know you are. So I don't expect everyone to stand up. It'd be amazing. We'd be here. I, I'm, I'm okay with being here for another hour. Not everybody will be. But, but two or three people, that's all I'm asking. Two or three people. Keep your testimony to three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. But just talk about that moment, any moment at all, but that moment when you knew that Jesus loves you. And it might be because of a direct encounter with God, or it might be because of something somebody else in this church or another church did for you. So I want to encourage you to do that. So I'm opening the floor. Anybody would like to go first? You want to go? Thank you. My testimony over the years has changed, but right now it's been uh, mainly focusing on how critically ill my daughter was last year, and that four different times she actually died and came back. And that happened um, that she went to the ER on January the 8th of last year. She'd been sick for a couple days, but um, why I'm giving a testimony is thanking all of you I know I had to bring that up for a reason, for all the prayers that you were prayer warriors. And starting on January 17th, I did start sending out a daily email. I just highlighted a couple prayer warriors. Please lift up my daughter and cover her in prayer 24-7. She's critically ill with COVID pneumonia. Fight for her. Surround her. Give her strength. And help me to turn this all over to our Heavenly Father. On January 22nd, I felt a glimmer of hope. She's still now out of the woods, and it's a very long road ahead. I thank everyone for all their prayers, wrapping Colleen in love and giving her strength to fight. Please continue lifting her up in prayer. Again, thanks to all of you. On February the 4th, the doctor asked me if he could be blunt and basically saying that there wasn't much chance. She had had several emergencies already that had been happen happening. Um, just to let you know, I was told that she would need a double lung transplant. She'd be on dialysis for the rest of her life. Thanking you for all the prayers. Her lungs are not great. No lung transplants at all. She's not on oxygen. And dialysis only lasted one week. When she did wake up and I took in a whiteboard because she had a trach and she couldn't talk to me. And the first day she couldn't write, she, she was so weak. But here's a fear as a parent. She said, I'm afraid to go to sleep because I'm afraid that I won't wake up. And every now and then, and I saved that, I took a picture of that little message and I still save that. But she's told me, you know, she didn't know what was going on when she was sedated but she'd feel like people were chasing her. She had to run and she had restless legs a lot. On March 4th, we got the first message from Colleen. Hello all, I wanna thank everyone for your thoughts and prayers and donations. I was told that I've had some times that it wasn't known if I was going to make it. And I know that it was those thoughts from you all that pulled me through. On just Thanksgiving of last year, I took a moment to post a thank you. 
Thanks for all the prayers for Colleen. This was my face, Facebook post. And the prayers for Colleen, the prayers for Mark, her husband, and Kenyon as they weathered her storm in the long road of her recovery. She still has some ongoing health issues as well as the lingering effects. She's been working from home. She still has a lot of, of uh, medical appointments. But thank you to family, friends, neighbors, friends through the military, my military friends, her military friends, and many churches for being such prayer warriors. And thank you, God, for the power of your love and for the power of prayer. December 30th, 2022, Colleen posted on Facebook that that day was her alive day, or at least the day that I'm marking is when I started to feel sick and this journey began. I'm sure that I was exposed to COVID-19 a few days earlier, but December 30th is the day that I started feeling that something wasn't quite right. For those not familiar with the concept of a live day, it marks the date someone had a traumatic and or near death experience. It is meant to take the power away from the negative event and transform it into a positive celebration that you are still alive. Alive days are intensely personal, and traumatic anniversaries can be difficult for those of us with post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, fears, phobias. Some people celebrate openly, but many others quietly acknowledge the day with their own personal traditions. I didn't want to add to other people's judgments or perceived judgments for this day. My military deployments, burn pit exposure, vaccinated, unvaccinated, some of the things that I read online of people condemning and wishing death upon the unvaccinated, really. A smoker, a former smoker, a vapor, overweight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm aware of some of you that have asked those questions of my family or friends when becoming aware of her, my situation. Did it really matter about any of those things as I was at death's door? Then something changed. I decided to go public. Even after I made that declaration to myself, I struggled trying to decide if I'd even publish this or mention it on social media. My anxiety made a valiant effort to persuade me to scrap the whole thing. Yet in the end, I knew I had to share my alive day. There's a lot of personal things that she did post, some things that I wasn't even aware of, some of uh, her military experiences, uh, military uh, sexual trauma, emotional problems, loss of friends, the scars on her heart and her soul. And she says that those were the heaviest. There's been days it was all she could do to just survive. She thought just surviving was going to be as good as it got. She accepted that life was never going to be the same. My PTSD would always be there in the background. I'd always be damaged, broken. Barely surviving was my new high bar standard. Some days I had full-blown panic attacks. One of her PTSD moments was, again, what if I go to sleep and don't wake up? What if I get COVID again? And that did happen to her. But this year she determined that her life was gonna be different. She's gonna celebrate being alive. She not only survived, and please excuse me, but I managed a pretty kick-ass comeback despite the setbacks. She thanks me for being a pit bull. The problem is I don't know how to strike an appropriate balance between celebrating being alive and the somber nature of the day. Making it public just doesn't seem like enough. But it's the, the right direction and it's a start. Um, April 21st of 2023, I posted uh, something. Colleen will be okay. She's alive. Four individual times there were emergencies and they did not expect her to live. That's not counting the daily challenges of her surviving. What if she had died when I wasn't at the ICU or Mark was out of town working or Kenyon was at school? Was I making deals with God, trying to talk him out of it, offering a trade? my life for hers. And every other time I've thought about death, I've been afraid. I still am, but I was willing to plead and beg for Colleen's life and hope that God would go for it. There was no basis for believing that we have a trading God. He's not in the habit of trading lives or souls. 
Did I believe it might be different for Colleen or for me? I couldn't fathom how I would handle the death of my daughter. Many times as I cried, my heart actually hurt. And I'm aware that some of you have gone through the same thing. It's a heart-wrenching experience. But what kept me going was realizing or knowing that I had no ability to get through this on my own. Trying to be strong for Colleen's son, Kenyon, when I felt so empty myself. But somehow I could pray or bleed, plead or yell or beg to our Heavenly Father. Sometimes when I felt like I couldn't even pray, I knew that others, mainly my church family, were praying for me, for her, for Kenyon and Mark. So I want to thank you for your faith and prayers. I knew that I was wrapped in loving arms, and held and given comfort, and I felt a peace that could come from no one but God. It was a Heavenly Father who could understand and understand my pain. A Heavenly Father who understood my lack of faith, my lack of trust, and who still accepts me as I am. A Heavenly Father who carried and still carries me when times seem unbearable. And then I think about how that Heavenly Father offered his son for me. My faith journey has not been a straight path, mainly due to my actions and my choices. But I do know who died for me, and I'm thankful for that. <clears throat> wow, that was, that was amazing. Um, you know, we don't often know the breadth and depth of what someone's going through when we pray for them. But no that prayer matters, and our prayers sustain each other, sustain us and that person as God continues to work. And as you just heard, Colleen is alive today. We give God glory for what he did in her life and that we could be part of it with prayer. Would anyone else like to offer a testimony? Come on. Barry, please. morning. Uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, when Derek talked about looking back on uh, <clears throat> how when he was younger and that, I keep thinking about uh, <clears throat> when I was growing up, I had some health issues uh, up until I was probably six or seven years old, some real serious <clears throat> health issues. And really, just hearing from what my mom and dad used to tell me, <clears throat> I wasn't really supposed to live past 10, 10 years old. Well, look at me now. I'm three quarters of a century old. <laughs> I'm 75. And <clears throat> there's been a few things, and some of you know it, that affected my daughter and and grandson but you've heard those stories and i'm not gonna go into that anymore but really if if it wasn't for the church family and the prayers and the lord helping us out uh, i don't know where i'd be today <clears throat> but as i've gotten older uh I always said that, and I brought this out at ad board last week, uh, I always wanted a brother or sister, and I never really had one. You, you didn't have a brother or sister to talk to, <clears throat> so, but really, I found over the years that I have a lot of brothers and sisters. <clears throat> it's all you people. You're really all my brothers and sisters here, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I do have a, jokingly, I have an adopted brother out here, but uh, <laughs> uh, if it wasn't for a lot of your prayers and things, 
<clears throat> the things that I've gone through just in the past, say five or six years with, with my head and some health issues. Uh, I know that between your prayers and God helping me out, I had, I've seen when I go to the, into the <clears throat> hospital for anything, you always think, oh, uh, how, when you're at home, <clears throat> thinking about what your health issues are, you think you're the one that nobody else has any problems. But you get in the hospital and see all these other people that are a lot younger than you are, and they look a lot worse. And you really think, wow, why, why is God being so good to me and not to them? <clears throat> and again, I had remarked once before that uh, back during COVID up until this time, I, with my health issues, I'd see this doctor and that doctor and I'd get a good report here, good report there. And I had people that I knew from here at the church plus other places that uh, they were passing away and going home to be with the Lord and they weren't nearly as old as I was. And you start beginning to wonder, why is God so good to you? And I'm to the point is I must be doing something right. So uh, with that, I don't want to keep droning on about this, but uh, I thank you for all your prayers, uh, for everything that's happened. I'm in pretty good shape now, except not a lot of hair, but, <laughs> but, uh, I do want to thank you for all your prayers, and I know that if it wasn't for you and for God answering the prayers, I wouldn't be in this shape standing up here talking to you today. Thank you. I know we're running a little over, but one more. Anyone would like to offer? No? Oh, sure, Ellen, please. I'm a little surprised I'm doing this. Um, ten years ago, um, in January, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I wasn't going to, somewhat because of who I wanted to have the um, operation, do the operation, couldn't have it till April. And I think it was about the end of uh, February. Even though I had faith, I was struggling. And one night, I couldn't sleep. And as I often do, when I'm struggling, I'll run down to the Bible. And I opened the Bible, just randomly opened it, and Psalm 91 was right there in front of me, and I read it. And by the end of the time of reading, I felt peace. Um, it ends with, because he cleaves to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And I claimed that, that he was going to give me long life. So that your prayers helped me through that time. And God was there with me. And I thank him for that. Um, the biggest thing I have to say is, when you're in trouble, run to the Lord, not away from him. Um, he'll eventually answer your questions as to why whatever's happening to you is going on. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Ellen.
Sorry, everybody online. I'm talking for the last five minutes and I wasn't on. I apologize. Wow, I'm not going to go through all that again. But I will say, I will reread. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. Our testimonies matter. People need to hear them. Because when you read scripture, it's often very confusing, hard to understand. But when you see scripture lived in life, things start to click. And you start to put things together and you see what God is really doing for us, in us, and with us. Amen. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Creator of all we know and do, as we bring our gifts this day, we ask you to help us trust you more. Forgive us when we put our trust in material things, when we don't believe that your future, that our future is in your hands. Remind us what we read today in your holy scriptures, that we have come to trust in God who raised from the dead and gave, raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. May our lives reflect that trust to others in mutual love and respect for one another. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to thank you all for your patience. Please stand as we sing the closing hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, number 377 in the blue hymnal.
Christ has brought us together in mutual love. We have gathered together to be sent out again with a welcome message of God's love. Go forth together to be living testimonies of Christ's love for the world. Amen. I